So, so thank you. I will give you a warning at the start. I am not a clinician. I don't pretend to be a clinician. I'm married to a clinician. She yells at me when I say things that are completely and utterly ridiculous. Um, and I honestly hope that nothing that I say today will deserve that treatment. Well, could you put the loud mirror on? You're, you're a little distant from the microphone. Uh, yes. <laughs> I, I want your wife to be able to hear what you say. Good, good. That's, that's important. All right. Is that better? Is it turned on? Okay. Right, so I, I'm going to give my very simplified view of what we have here, uh, the, the dramatically simplified clinical workflow and then what I'm going to focus on. So the first part, identify variants. This is, of course, technically easy and getting easier. Use what we already know to make sense of them. This is about the best we can do right now. Uh, and what we already know includes um, previous studies, uh, algorithmic things. Basically, use what we know to make sense of them and then do something about it. This is the part that I'm definitely not involved with. But this center part, use what we already know to make some sense of them, is where I think uh, the database integration and the types of resources we have at the EBI can be useful. So to put this into a little bit uh, uh, finer point, to go from research understanding of human variation to using it in more standard medical practice, uh, I think we need a few things. And this is, again, my perspective from, uh, from sitting on top of a number of very large databases. We need consistent, uh, traceable data generation and analysis routines. We simply have to know what we have done. Uh, robust annotation based on public information sources, uh, such as those that we have at the EBI or the NCBI. I think it's probably true that about 95% of all the information that could be used to understand and interpret human variation is already in the public domain. This is existing information. Obviously, as we generate more, this number will go down. I've been saying this for a while. Nobody challenges this, per this percentage, so I just keep saying it. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, we need to report some of this information into medical records so that it can be used. So I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to talk about two things uh, in the, under this uh, concept of database integration. One is the idea of continually updating and update uh, the existing information to ensure that it's accurate and comprehensive. Uh, and I'm just going to start on some of the ways that we do this in the research setting. We have a database at the EBI. It's called the European Genome Phenome Archive. Uh, this is a secure database. It stores the results of data generated from uh, research into molecular medicine. This is what the home page looks like. Uh, we organize the data by study, by data sets, by data providers. This turns out to be uh, useful distinctions uh, as very large data sets are often used in multiple studies. And people who create data sets often create multiple data sets. And just rather than look at the home page, here's some text about it. Uh, the EGA is a, for secure storage. We provide authorized access to all types of data sets uh, that get generated in the context of, of research into medical, uh, molecular medicine, DNA sequence, <coughs> genotypes, transcriptomics, phenotype data. Uh, we currently have data associated with GWAS studies, cancer studies, uh, the Human Epigenome Consortium, UK10K, and many other smaller scale projects. Uh, we are the peer archive, uh, so to speak, of the dbGaP database at the NCBI uh, for legal reasons and restrictions. We don't exchange the data that's in the databases uh, between the EGA and, uh, and dbGaP. Uh, but we have exchanged metadata. So if you go to the EGA and search for a study that's available in dbGaP, you'll actually find it. And you'll find that it's available in dbGaP and vice versa. If you go to dbGaP and search for something like the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium, you'll find that we have it and a link to how to get it. So besides storing that sort of data, this data that's generated in the context of uh, doing research into molecular medicine, we are accumulating a tremendous amount of data on the human genome sequence to understand what it's doing. Uh, these include projects that the NHGRI funds, like ENCODE, but they're coming from all sorts of different projects. We integrate this together uh, into the Ensemble Genome Browser. It's how we provide information on the human genome and annotation. We think the types of things that we have there are useful for understanding what the genome is doing. This is just some example of some of the things that we have from uh, alignments where we have regions of evolutionary constraint to genes and gene families and so on. Within Ensemble, we've pulled in a lot of different data sources uh, that are human variation data. Not only do we bring in the polymorphism data from dbSNP, 
uh, and try to separate that into things that are coming from thousand genomes or other places. Uh, we've been bringing in locus-specific data from locus-specific databases uh, using a standard sequence that uh, we've developed and continue to develop uh, in collaboration with the NCBI and other people. We have structural polymorphism data, uh, mutation data from COSMIC and HGMD, as well as phenotype data from a number of sources, uh, and the types of raw materials people use in their research. So this just gives some numbers. Uh, right now, there's, you know, as you know, there's around 20,000 uh, 20, genes. Uh, we have information on somewhere around 100,000 variants. Uh, some of these, of course, overlap. Uh, and all of this data is, is there. We update it continuously with each release. This is still a tiny fraction of the variants that are available in the genome, and that number is now touching something like 45 million. Going from, I mentioned this a little bit already, going from LSDBs or even diagnostic labs uh, to the type of central resources, we've worked to try to uh, break down the informatics barriers to doing this. Breaking down the informatics barriers does not solve the problems here. Uh, there are many other barriers, including uh, the ease at which one can do this, uh, aspects of intellectual property, uh, whether or not people are willing to share. But we have worked to bring down the informatics barriers. Uh, and, and like I said, we have done this in collaboration with NCBI and with, with other groups. So part two, uh, provide a method to search the relevant resources uh, using variants or eventually whole genomes as inputs. So we can collect data together. And in fact, uh, we've already heard this morning that people are collecting data together to make their own interpretations. Searching through this and searching through the most up-to-date thing uh, is something that will continue to be a problem. Google is a valuable resource. Searching Google with a chromosome coordinate and the letter A doesn't return anything useful, um, at least not usually. One of the ways we've done this is through something that we called uh, the Variant Effect Prediction Tool, or the VEP. Uh, what this does is takes in individual sites of variant, variation in the genome uh, and does a number of things. One, it calculates the effect of the SNPs in the context of the ensemble genes and regulatory features. We provide this with a web interface, uh, with a more standard computer interface that people could put into a pipeline. Uh, we've put it back towards uh, the previous version of the human genome. Uh, we're working, right now it doesn't do structural variants very effectively, uh, but we're working to increase that functionality, especially in the context of ICGC. Uh, and bringing in information that we find in projects like ENCODE to understand when the variants are disrupting known transcription factor binding sites. Uh, we've created the ability to run this without connecting to the internet, so uh, it doesn't have to uh, break security. Uh, and we have, uh, we have now written the code and are in the process of testing it for user-defined plugins so people can do all sorts of very creative things. And, and finally, we, we plan to start in 2012 just returning the answer as to whether a variant is seen in an EGA data set, so within, behind the protected wall, uh, and then tell people how to apply to get more information about that. So this is effectively a variant-based search of EBI's data resources, and we would like to make this even more comprehensive as a variant-based search of EBI's data resources. So I'm going to give you some examples on, on how this works in practice, just to show you what I mean. Um, at present, we bring in all the information that we have in various ensemble databases. That in and of itself is a hub of information that we pull in from a lot of other EBI resources. Uh, and we do this in a way that we've, we've written a whole host of code. Now it's very modularized uh, and provide the results through the web browser. This is an example of the, the way the web interface works right now, the types of things we return. Because we could do this, it runs generally uh, across all species. Um, human is where it's used the most, uh, but we actually have a lot of people doing farm animal research that like to do this. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of profit involved in that. Uh, we support multiple data formats. Um, and importantly, and I'll come on to this a little bit, we return uh, information using standardized terms so that everyone ideally understands what we're talking about. Uh, we provide co-location with existing variants, so whether or not it already exists in dbSNP, is this a thousand genomes variant, and so on. Um, we can return information in standard nomenclature, like HGVS. We have pre-calculated SIFT, polyphen, and condel across the entire genome for every possible amino acid substitution. Um, although I think there are questions as to the validity of this, I can tell you from the usage standpoint, this is incredibly popular. People use this constantly. Um, and uh, the ability to filter against HapMap or 1,000 genomes frequency data as well. 
So this is the way the output comes. It's really a very simple uh, form. It actually goes quite a long way across the page. You can see it's kind of blurred out on the side. I, I think I can show you sort of the rest of it where we go across and provide a whole host of information. Using the command line version, this can be customized in a uh, very considerable way. I mentioned already the importance of talking about things in standardized terms. It turns out that even very simple things, and one of the points that I want to make here is that everyone knows the uncertainty uh, in this process very close to them. But they think other parts of the process are much more certain than they are. Almost every part of the process is filled with uncertainty. So for example, if you return that a variant disrupts a splice site, you might not be talking about the same thing if you talk to two, other, to two people. Splice sites mean different things to different people, even very simple things like that. So we've worked with the sequence ontology group. So when we actually say a variant disrupts a splice donor, it has a defined meaning. And we've worked with NCBI. So when they say it disrupts a splice donor, it has the same meaning. This is actually, these kind of small things uh, can be important advancements, especially as you try to combine data across uh, larger domains. This is what our SIFT and polyphen matrix looks like. Like I said, we've calculated it for every possible amino acid change in the human genome. Um, and this is actually a very popular resource. Regulatory region consequences, uh, especially with the observation that GWAS data uh, appears very commonly in non-coding regions of the genome. The ENCODE project has identified uh, and been able to annotate many of those, um, uh, those associated SNPs uh, with, with regulatory region disruptions or apparent ones. Uh, so we've gone through and incorporating uh, data from the ENCODE project to return whether a variant exists in a regulatory region whether it exists in an identified uh, transcription factor binding motif, and even whether it exists in a highly informative position within that motif. So you can know if your variant hits, for example, that great big C in the middle, or one of those tiny little ACs over on the side. And that might be important for you to make some decision. So this comes down to our ability to, to answer kind of this relatively simple question, has this variant ever been seen before? I think it's actually becoming one of the most common, maybe one of the most important questions uh, in human genomics, but it's actually incredibly difficult to answer. Most people who are trying to answer this are collecting all the data that they can themselves to try to answer this question. So if you go back to, uh, to the 1,000 Genomes issue of Nature back in October 2010, Nature said that there was about 2,700 genomes. They said there would be 30,000 by the end of 2011. I have no idea how close we are to this number. Uh, but I do know that it's very difficult to get your hands on any large number of genomes if you want to use them as, as any sensible control. Um, it's also true for exomes. And even the data under controlled access is challenging to get, as any of you who have ever tried to do so will know. So just a couple of thoughts on the future. I want to make it very clear, Ensemble is not a clinical decision support tool. Uh, and only a fraction of the important resources that we can uh, access with it have really been presented today. But I do think that some of the things we're doing shows the way forward. Uh, the data is comprehensive. Uh, it's versioned, so you know what, you, what you're looking at, when you looked at it, when we created it. It's standardized. We used controlled terminology. We update it regularly. We have both evidence-based and, and algorithmic aspects to it. We're fully open. All the data can be taken and used. And, and, and to finally say this one more time, there's uncertainty at every step in the process. Uh, the genome reference is uncertain. The gene set is uncertain. There is no such thing as a single human gene set. And so while we all recognize the little areas of uncertainty, it's important to recognize that everything is uncertain, and we just have to make the best possible decisions given that. And so just to acknowledge the people that, that uh, actually do all of this, as well as the people who um, pay for me to go to work every day and get it done. Great. Liz, question. Paul, can you go back to that slide where you said the 95% of the yes. data? <laughs> yeah. I, I want to make sure like, I have this right. But the, and the question is, what's the, what, what is our denominator here? Because is your denominator 95% could be used? Yeah. Your denominator here must be uh, information that is generated and is either publicly accessible or is not publicly accessible, correct? So essentially that's true. If, if one has a, a variant of unknown significance, for example, 
it's, I think it's true that about, if you were to completely go and track that down, given only the variant, about 95% of the information you would use to do that, which might be, let's say, uh, a crystallized protein structure, or might be uh, whether, or not, um, uh, whether or not that has been observed in, in other populations, I think that's available in the public domain. I don't think there are large-scale private sources of that information. I would say 95% of the information that could be used to interpret the variants that I'm finding doesn't exist anywhere. So, 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 actually, so I'm, I'm making a very different point. I'm not talking about the information to solve the problem. I'm talking about the information that exists that could be used. Yes, yes. Yes, I, I agree completely. The information required to solve the problem is dramatically missing. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Great. So I'd, I'd like to propose that we move to the, because our interesting speakers have put us a bit behind time.